Great, good evening. My name is Jocelyn Padron Racines, and along with Sierra Lloyd and Renee Marlowe, we're going to serve as this evening's moderators. Um, we are master students at the Maxwell School's Public Administration Program, and we created this event as part of our final project for a class we're taking in the Cultural Foundations of Education Department titled Race, Gender, and the School to Prison Pipeline. Thank you all for coming tonight as we talk about the school to prison pipeline and its effects on today's society. First, we would like to give special recognition to the Onondaga Nation as we stand on the land of their ancestors. We'd also like to thank those who helped us in planning this event, our professor, Mary Canito Colville, who is also one of the panelists you'll be hearing from later, and our advisor, Joshua Kennedy. The first part of the event tonight is a presentation which will give an overview of what the School to Prison Pipeline is and some of the impacts that we found in our research. After our presentation, we will introduce the panelists, ask each of the panelists the questions, and then open it up to you, the audience, to ask your own questions. The School to Prison Pipeline is a metaphor used to conceptualize a range of social phenomena that are complexly intertwined. It is most commonly used to describe the way students are systematically pushed out of the education system and into the judicial system. As we hope to show you tonight, students of color are disproportionately being pushed out of schools and turned over to the police. Throughout the course of this presentation, please keep in mind all students of color, including Native Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders, as these populations of students are often overlooked in this pipeline. So for the first section of the presentation, we will start with a brief history to show where the pipeline grew from in today's educational system. Systematic racism is certainly not new, and neither is a multifaceted intersection of education and incarceration. But we hope to show, especially in today's climate, how executive and congressional actions have aided to further segregate education and push students out of educational opportunities. So let's begin with a look at how presidential policies have affected school discipline. All right, so Richard Nixon ran for president during the Vietnam War, and he promised the American people that he had a plan to end the war. He also took a strong stance against crime and declared drug use to be the public enemy number one. The fulfillment of that promise came in 1970 with the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act. John Ehrlichman, Nixon's domestic policy chief, admitted to Harper, Harper Magazine's reporter Don Baum that Nixon's war on drug was a fight against hippies and blacks. On the screen, you can see what he admitted. He states, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. The quote continues to say, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Nixon's chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, also quoted Nixon as saying, you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this while not appearing to. This kind of rhetoric and systematic racism continues today. If certain groups can be vilified, candidates can use them to raise fear in people and make promises to lock them up, export them, or build walls to block them from coming in. The Act of 1970 has been revamped over the years and used to increase the surveillance of black people right into the schools they attend. Now with the Reagan era, anti-drug and anti-crime continued to be a popular subject for politicians. Reagan revised Nixon's act as the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which then created the Drug-Free Schools and Communities Act. The result was drug prevention programs in schools, which encouraged schools to find students who were suspected of using drugs and alcohol. The result? Students of color were disproportionately targeted as they were under more surveillance and used to justify need for funding. The more drug and alcohol abusers the school had, the greater their need for the prevention programs and the funding to pay for them. On another note, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign became very popular in white communities. It makes the war on drugs seem easy. 
If people just say no to drugs, we wouldn't have a problem. Though it greatly ignores the issues around drugs like poverty, unemployment rates, and lack of education, this sentiment around drugs is still around today. In fact, in an interview with our class, a local police officer said, if they would just stop selling drugs, they wouldn't get arrested. When our class asked a police officer how these individuals should make money in Syracuse, where over half the city was unemployed at some point in 2015, the police officer said they should find a job. These simple answers ignore the complexity surrounding drugs and also ignores the facts that show people of color are being disproportionately locked up even though their white counterparts have been proven to be just as likely to be committing the same crimes. With the Bill Clinton administration, we see the enactment of the Gun-Free School Act of 1994 and the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1994 also. These types of legislation divert attention away from teaching towards scrutinizing student behavior and over-reporting infractions with demonst which demonstrated a need for additional funding. The Gun-Free Schools Act was the initial push towards a zero tolerance towards zero tolerance policies, which are policies that rely on force and arrest for relatively minor disciplinary issues. According to the US Department of Education, currently about 90% of schools have implemented zero, zero tolerance policies to deal with either violence or threats. The infamous mass shooting of Columbine High School took place in 1996. Before Columbine, school crime rates were stable or declining by the mid-1990s. With the aftermath of this tragedy, the aftermath of this tragedy led to enhanced security measures, not in white suburban schools where these shootings took place, but in urban schools that were low performing with high numbers of students of color. Security features were usually tested in schools where there were no problems previously, and no research has been able to prove their effectiveness. With the George Bush administration, our country saw the enactment of No Child Left Behind, as well as tax breaks, which meant less spending on education in conjunction with policies that prioritized standardized testing. Research tells us that this gave schools incentive to get rid of low-performing students instead of investing in methods to remediate them. As schools lose funding, they cut back on school psychiatrists, arts, music programs, athletics, and after-school activities all which are resources which may help students in high trauma neighborhoods de-stress and navigate heavy emotions that lead, to so, that lead to what some would consider to be poor behavior. Furthermore, while government funding for social welfare, environmental protection, and corporate regulations under the Bush administration decreased, funding for prisons and domestic militarization increased. This is a graph of the U.S. Uh, prison population from 1925 to 2010. It starts with the era of the Roaring Twenties, Prohibition, and the Great Depression. It shows a slight rise during the Civil Rights Movement during the 50s and 60s, but it's not until presidential candidates realized they could get more votes by declaring a war on drugs that the prison population really began to rise. In 2012, President Obama gave a Father's Day speech in Chicago that asked where all the black fathers had gone. By the end of 2013, over half a million black males would be in jail serving time. That's more than twice as many black males in prison today than the total prison population at any time before the war on drugs. However, it's not just the fathers missing time with their children, it's increasingly mothers too. The next section of our presentation looks at how the war on drugs has led to the, to the school to prison pipeline through decreases in funding to schools and racial segregation and targeting. So currently federal policymakers have cut ongoing federal funding for states and localities, thereby worsening state fiscal conditions. So generally, state funding for K through 12 is distributed using a formula, but share of total education funding provided by the state government usually differs from state to state. Um, and in this current school year, at least 23 states will provide less funding than when the Great Recession took hold in 2008. And additionally, eight states 
have cut general funding per student by about 10% or more over this period. And when cuts happen at the state and federal level, local school districts have to make up the gap. Local governments raise revenue for their local districts by collecting taxes from residential and commercial properties. Wealthier, property-rich localities have the ability to collect more in property taxes, and thus schools in wealthier communities have over $15,000 available per student each year, while schools in less affluent, poor communities have often $5,000 or less per student each year. Then, when you factor in the fact that cities and sub suburbs tend to be segregated, there is racial disparity in access to well-funded schools. Inequalities then accumulate over years, leaving many poor and minority students without basic essentials in their schools, such as textbooks, modern buildings, computers, or libraries. Scholarship tells us that urban schools have difficulty attracting well-qualified or experienced teachers for various reasons. An example would be the inability to provide competitive salaries to teachers in districts that have less revenue from property taxes in comparison to schools that receive higher levels of funding per student in more affluent neighborhoods. Research has also shown that as the number of African American and Latino students in a school increases, white teachers are more likely to leave and gravitate towards suburban schools. In our course this semester, we learned about various studies that have been conducted on teachers of all different racial backgrounds that were designed to gauge their ex expectations or perceptions about their students. These efforts tell us that minority students are often perceived to have lower academic cap capabilities and are more prone to exhibit what is considered to be disruptive behavior. However, scholarship explains that the difference in culture and society backgrounds influences not only how teachers expect students to behave in school, but also how they engage with these students. We also know that students of color are aware of negative perceptions about their intelligence, and such ideas can add to further cultural clashes within the classroom or depress their academic performance in general. Teachers' misunderstanding cultural differences has led to African-American students being referred to special education for behavioral issues at a higher rate compared to their peers. In particular, African-American students are overrepresented in soft disability categories such as emotional disturbance. In hard categories such as hearing or vision impairment, the diagnosis rate of African-Americans and white students is almost the same. Overall, minority students receive a higher rate of special education designations that depend on a clinical judgment rather than biological data. These students are typically placed in more restrictive classrooms that take them away from the mainstream curricula. Furthermore, when it comes to school discipline, zero tolerance policies over the years have been shown to be unequally applied to students of color. Thus, black and brown students are overrepresented in, sc in school suspensions and other disciplinary consequences. Again, the inequality happens in soft categories such as classroom disruption and not in ha hard categories like weapon possession. This again is because of cultural differences and teacher biases. The consequences of removing these students from academic instruction further increases dropout rates and pushout rates, while also systematically increasing the white achievement gap. In some jurisdictions, students who have been suspended or expelled are sent to disciplinary alternative schools. These schools are sometimes run by private for-profit companies and are immune from educational accountability standards, such as minimum classroom hours and curriculum requirements. They also may fail to provide meaningful educational services to the students who need them the most. As a result, struggling students return to their regular schools unprepared, are permanently locked into inferior educational settings or are funneled through alternative schools and into the juvenile justice system. On this slide is actually a picture of Shaw Cross Academy, which is one of Philadelphia School District's 19 alternative schools. Since 2004, the campus has been operated by Camelot Schools, which is a for-profit company that specializes in alternative education and runs four alternative schools for the district. 
Camelot's 2010-2011 contract with the district is $9.1 million to serve 883 students at its four schools. It can be said with confidence that most of our schools, especially schools that are in urban, low-income, and or minority districts, are monitored and ran like correctional facilities. Here are the reasons why many schools suggest that they use certain prison-like security measures. And although some of these reasons may hold some truth, we shouldn't overlook their contribution to the school-to-prison pipeline. In regards to surveillance, anyone can start a security business, and because schools have to use the lowest bidder, they tend to purchase security systems without proven records of their efficiency or social impact. Today we see many school districts using student ID badges to recognize their pupil populations. This type of education policy allows for students to be located or monitored even outside of school hours and by school officials and law enforcement. Police presence in a school can lead to escalated interactions between students and law enforcement. And if it was really deterring behavior, um, suspensions, arrests, these numbers should be decreasing, but instead we see the opposite results. This chart shows the likelihood of people born in 2001 to end up in prison at some point in their lives. The factors leading to this are all the things we mentioned, including the increased surveillance of black and brown communities and cultural differences. As we go into the next section of our talk, we need to express that the education and judicial systems are operating as they were intended to. Nixon's administration admitted to targeting black people and hippies, but certainly they were not the first to create policies around discrimination. In 1868, a member of the Chicago Board of Education made a statement that still resonates in education and justice systems today. We, sh we should rightfully have the power to arrest all these little beggars, loafers, and vagabonds that infest our city, take them from the streets, and place them in schools where they are compelled to receive education and learn moral principles. We certainly should not permit a reckless and indifferent part of our population to rear children in ignorance to become a criminal and lawless class within our community. The war on drugs and the zero, policy, zero tolerance policies are continuation of this statement. They have, show, they have drawn racial boundaries and separated parents from their children and children from the supports they need in school. While in detention centers, children receive little instruction except on how to sit still and be quiet. Moral principles like respect are more important than the curriculum mandated, mandated by law. Our Puritan foundations are still well intact today, and students caught in the criminal justice system fall further and further behind their white classmates. We've been touching on the effects of this system beyond the schools, but we'll now dive deeper into a bigger picture of how our, economy, how our economy operates on a system of oppression. The school to prison pipeline is merely a symptom of a disease that is deeply rooted. Ken McGrew writes about the, the dangers of only focusing on the tip of the iceberg. He quotes Erica Miner's book, Schooling the Carceral State, Challenging the, prison, the School to Prison Pipeline. She says, school to prison, cradle to tomb, schoolhouse to jailhouse. While these frameworks have become increasingly popular and have placed the question of criminalization of youth on, onto a national stage, this concept often obscures the need for a wider and deeper analysis capable of su supporting sustainable, dynamic, and stronger movements to end our nation's commitment to penal incarceration. In his own book, McGrew emphasizes that our capitalist system is founded on the dehuman dehumanization of millions. With the emancipation of slaves and the end of the Civil War, how is the United States going to rebuild the, the nation and its economy? It had more people to put to work than ever before and less people to pay for their services. A new form of slavery arose and continues today. 30% of California's firefighting force is made up of inmates receiving less than $1.60 per day. This is one of the best paying jobs available in prison. On average, privately run prison pay 
pay about 17 cents per hour, while federal prisons pay $1.25 per hour. While crime rates continue to drop, incarceration rates continue to increase because private prisons depend on full capacity to make a profit. Their ability to lobby Congress and pressure police has resulted in increased arrests and convictions of minor offenses. To quote Ken McGrew again, poor people and people of color are overrepresented in every arrest category and in jails and prisons because they are actively targeted relative to wealthier members of society. For example, by legislators who enact dr drastically harsher penalties for rock cocaine compared to powder cocaine, by police who stop and frisk people of color incessantly in hopes of finding an excuse to arrest them, and by judges who sentence them unconstitutionally to debtor's prison by imposing fines they cannot afford. Our economy is dependent on slave labor as much as it was when slavery was legal. Companies like American Express, Microsoft, AT&T, Nordstrom's, Boeing, Dell, and many, many more are profiting off the cheap labor provided to them by a system that has criminalized poverty and skin color. Keep in mind that many more people have suffered at the hands of this system than those shown in these two pictures. We've used the Chinese to build our railroads, Native Americans for their land. We've criminalized Latinos and Muslims, refugees, and immigrants. America, the land of the free and home of the brave, has only 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. It is built on imprisonment of those we fear. At this point, we would like to introduce our panelists. We will ask each one a question in relation to our presentation and then turn it over to you for questions. Thank you for your continued attendance. 